Hello Life Changes Church, welcome to our YouTube channel. We have got an amazing word prepared for you, so why don't you take out your notebook and your pen as we get ready to listen to what God has for us. Um, I want to read, we are jumping and we aren't in a series, but we are trusting God to speak in and through our Vision Sunday word that God spoke out of Isaiah 43. And this was the challenge. God reminds them of what he'd done for them in that great day when he parted the seas, took his people through in the book of Exodus, and then swallowed up Pharaoh's army. It was just like a profound day that as a people, you don't forget. In communities, we have those. The days that, that God gave life to wombs where doctors had said there wouldn't be life. Those are days you don't forget, days where people were set free from cancers, where people who said they would never find love, we stand at their weddings and we celebrate. Those are days you don't forget as communities. But this would have been a significant day as God liberated his people from their oppressor army that was chasing after them. Incredible day. And so in that day, God re reminds them in the scripture of what happened there. Then he says this in Isaiah 43, but forget all that. It's quite an incredible shift and change. He's saying, I've done that, but forget all that. Why? He says, it is nothing compared to what I'm going to do with you. This is God speaking. This isn't Isaiah making things up. Let me think maybe what, this is God speaking through his prophet, for I am doing something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Who right now in the areas of life, you're saying, I would love a pathway in the wilderness. It feels like everything's dry. I'm chewing on sand. And actually, I would just love a pathway that would make things clear. I, I, I want a pathway through the challenges of life. I want a pathway for careers. I want a pathway for relationships. I want a pathway to follow God. says, I will make it. But actually, if you're not going to perceive, you're not going to see what I'm doing, there's a challenge in our ability to walk in that. And I want to speak into something of that from a scripture, and, and in, a, in a sense, a, 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 a scripture that I've used a thousand times in different counseling conversations, but never preached. I've, I've spoken to many young men, older men, ladies, people walking life. They're saying, uh, it's in the context of, I don't know what God wants with me. I don't know if I can find it. I'm, I'm following through open doors. I'm just walking. And I want to put something of a word into the five of us. Number one, to save Gabe, Scott, and Shelley, and Brett, and, and Fiona, a thousand counseling hours. Because actually the Bible does give us a clear pathway to know something of his will and call for our lives. Because if you're going to hear a scripture like, I want to do something new, you're going, well, I didn't even know what you were doing. How am I supposed to know if this is new? Maybe it's just the old. And yet we come to a God a little bit like we come to many other things in life. We're looking for deductions or we've discounted our own ability to hear God. And said, well, let the preacher man hear and maybe a prophet will come to town and maybe they'll call me out the crowds. I don't know about you, but in church in the 80s and 90s, when a prophet man was coming to town, everyone ran to church. Church is filled up. I just need to hear from God. And I hope the reason that maybe we're moving on from this, God is speaking to us and realize he's got his spirit and he wants to speak to you today. And I want you to walk out here, maybe with not a full knowledge of that, but a confidence that there's a father in heaven, a good father, a perfect father who has a plan for your life. You're not just doing time until eternity. Oh, too many Christians just doing time. My great day when Jesus saved me in 1964. That was a long time ago. What's happened since then? That was a great day. Don't get me wrong. It's an unbelievable day. God, I got saved at 14 years old. I'm not going to tell you when that was, but it was a long time ago. But if I'm only ever talking about what God did in 1993 for the mathematicians in the world, if I only ever talk about that, what is God doing now? And I'm telling you, part of it is because we don't know that there's a father, there's a plan, a will, a desire, Acts speaks, even where we should live, the times in which we should live, God speaks into that. And so there is the general will of God, yes, the, the mandated by his word, his commandments, how we should live, our marriages, how we should hold our lives, whether we should, should you be generous? I, don't, I need to pray about whether I should be generous. No, you don't. Stop praying, read the Bible, and obey. Should I love people? Stop. You don't need to pray about it. Should I forgive? Oh, I'm seeking the Lord and whether I should forgive that person. Honestly, stop seeking. Just do it. That is the general will of God. And if we are so stuck up, we don't believe in those things, we're still wrestling that things, you're never going to settle. Well, God, what is it you got me? It, I see that guy. Who remembers that like, guy in, in Standard 9? Everyone's true. Oh, grade, grade 9, Standard 7, that one. 
My boy's in that grade right now. So it's choosing subjects kind of time of life. You're saying, I've got to choose because the subjects. And, 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 and most of us are like, if, you, if you're in my area, straight six. History, geography, science, maths, Afrikaans, English. You're like, I'll take that. That sounds, it's worked for generations past. It'll work. But these days, they got options, and they got all sorts of different things that you can do. I remember my one mate, Kim de Vasconcelos, a really bad left-arm bowler, but an incredibly bright guy, who in standard seven, seven grade nine, said to us, I'm going to become a brain surgeon. We're like, okay, that's great. Then, and you think, like, you laugh it off. You know what Kim de Vasconcelos does now? He's a brain surgeon. He knew that years ago, and, and I would have loved to have that clarity, and most people live their whole life without having measures of clarity. I want to tell you something. The Bible speaks to us how you can know God does, but the first thing is that he deals with our thinking and our believing, and he gets into that, and he, we've got to get to a place where we truly do believe him. See, I have limitations, and so do you. I have limitations in my resource, but God doesn't. I have limitations in my energy. I obviously have limitations on a surfboard. That's very obvious. God doesn't. And so when I come to the glorious one, to see the new starts with a trusting him, I make that decision that is part of my everyday life when I trust him and to look forward. And so as we speak into this, I want to speak about this thing, the will of God. Because we can tell people you have more of them, but, but what is the more? Just a generic more? Well, there's three different words used in the Greek for this thing of the will of God. The first is a word prosthesis, which means to plan in advance. I've got three boys. Maybe if you've got kids in the room, you try as best as possible, put some plans in advance. You know that if you don't put sandwiches in the bag when you go to the beach, they're going to be hungry and they want the good stuff. They're going to start. They don't start with sausage rolls these days. They start with sushi. And you start bargaining down and you kind of move your way up and you meet somewhere in the middle. That's what parenting in 2023 looks like. Prepare yourself. But, but, but there's this prothesis, which is a God, a Father in heaven, who plans in advance for his children. The second word is B-O-U-L-E. I don't know. It's, it sounds like that boule, that game you play, but it's not. It means a fixed intention which cannot be changed by others. The challenge is I've got desires for my kids, but I can't control their everything. But I want to tell you the Father's will, His desire, and His plans for life cannot be changed by the enemy, cannot be afflicted and changed by generational curses, cannot be limited. No, He is in control. And when I trust it and believe it, all the things that want to come and limit and hold and make smaller, God speaks over. And the last one that settles me is this word, telema. And it means a desire, it's a desire which God has for his children, his sons and daughters, to fall in line with his plans and his will. There's a desire. Again, do you believe it? Or are you just doing time in church and maybe one day we'll get to heaven and ask God? No, we call to live. We call to breathe with purpose in our veins. And I'm telling you, too much of the church are purposeless because they don't actually know that they can know their purpose. And have an idea, a design of what his desire, his plan, and his urging. So I want to take us to an incredible scripture in Romans 12 that I have used in lots of counseling hours, but never really preached. And I want to preach it today to help us because this is not just for the new believer. This is not just for someone who's never again life. I'm telling you, every day I have to come before the truth of God's plan for my life and fall before and say, God, would you speak? Are you ready for that? Can I pray before I read the word? Lord, I thank you for your word. We submit to your word today. Even as I read the scripture, I pray lights would come on. I pray revelation about who you are would come into hearts and minds. I pray speak and let this be a moment that would shape lives and destinies and futures for your glory, King. We worship you. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, Brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's a thousand sermons in those few lines. A thousand. But I want to give us a few points and work us through that scripture and maybe just provoke a conversation between you and your father. 
maybe just provoke a confidence to come into your soul to know that you're not just doing time on earth so one day you can end up before God and he goes, well, what did you do with it? And you go, well, you didn't tell me. He says, really? Honestly, I feel the weight of this. I'm in Cape Town, not because of a life plan. I really didn't want to be a pastor. I've told it many times. But God, the God of heaven, the God who speaks, the God who's louder, he knows how to work, how to speak. And for some of you, you're in a, a job and God's saying, I need you to pioneer a business so employment comes to this nation. Is if it's just financial terms that will determine that path, I'm telling you it's not enough. Because economies, as we can see by the interest rate on Thursday, they go up and down. And currencies, they go up and down. And if it's just uh, tick boxes, I sit with so many people saying, uh, should I get married to this person? Well, I don't know. I'm not God. Okay, well, this is what I did. I've got a pros and cons box. Ah. <laughs> Honestly. Honestly, you fussy little person. Get rid of your pros and cons box. Get on your knees and before the living God and allow him to speak because only his word will sustain you. Your pros and cons won't. It just won't. Was that helpful for you? I got a big amen. Thank you. I'm trying to be helpful. And, um, but Paul is speaking and he says, I urge. He says, therefore. We're now, I'm no English major, but therefore means something happened before. And because of that, we're here. He's saying, therefore, because of the grace of God that he just unpacked and said, there's nothing compared to the grace of God. I was the worst of sinners and I still do what I don't want to do. But the grace of God, it cannot be added to. There's nothing more than Jesus and his grace that he pours out. He says, therefore, I urge you. When the apostle Paul urges you, it means sit up and listen. It means this is not games. This is not some flippant word. No, the apostle who didn't play games with his life, who made a 180 degree turn because God spoke into his life and he faced every trial and tribulation. He didn't buy into a life of comfort. He born into a life that involved whipping and beating and stoning and lack of food and shipwreck and snake bikes, and it just continued. I'm going to need that water, please. And um, he says, I urge you. He's saying, this is important. And he says, you've got to get your view right. In view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. See, we no longer offer up dead animals. We no longer bring our sacrifices, your, your giving, and we thank you so profoundly for your giving. But that's not some kind of sacrifice to make sure that we're just making sure Jesus is enough. He says, no, but there is a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice that we come as living beings before God, but our view is important. It says, in view of God's mercy. He says, are your eyes on his mercy? The challenge is if we took out our phones like we did to get the, the QR link, and we looked at screen time, what would be your view? The average teenager in America, seven to eight, nine hours on Instagram and on these social media things that are shouting views at them. And they're living lives to get views by doing crazy things to get the applause of men and women they don't even know or like. I spend most of my teenage years doing that, trying to be liked by people I didn't even like. And people spend their whole life doing it. It's got to stop. And he says, why? In view of God's mercy. Would you keep God's mercy in your view? Which means sometimes you've got to change your perspective. You've got to go, I'm looking this way. I'm going to turn this way. We were driving yesterday in the overstrand and the seas this way. And we drove past and these two people on their balcony were looking up. And I thought, why would they be facing the other way? I even said to the family, I said, look at these dwarf people here. The sea's the other way. And then I looked right, and there's just these mountains hanging over the other. Oh, that's what they're looking at. He says, in view of God's mercy, not in view of your abilities, not in view of your portion, not in view of your performance, not in view of your past, in view of God's mercy. He says, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You want to know what the general will of God is? Right there. Live a life that is holy and pleasing to God, which means you've got to know his words so you can know what pleases him. I've realized the things that please me in life don't please my wife. Part of our courting and dating or whatever language you want to use, I had to learn how to honor her. I had to learn that she doesn't like climbing mountains and surfing. I took on a jet ski on our honeymoon. It, it brought on a great fight and, t and her nails dug in through my life jacket, drawing blood. Because, true story, yeah? 
I got up a chain ladder by lying to her, telling my 90-year-old grandmother had climbed up. It was nothing. And then I had to climb down next to her to walk her down because we just very different. Sorry, some of you think I'm the hard, nastiest person in the world. This was a process of understanding. But there's also a process of how do I honor God? What brings Him praise? Because I'm telling you, religious piousness doesn't. And I'm telling you, religious acts that are to some foreign God, sitting some foreign idol, they don't bring glory to the God. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your trust. He wants you. That's what honors and brings a joy, and he wants you full of faith. So how? How, Mark? You're talking about, I can know the will of God? Yes. Here's how. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Let's just start with the do not. Do not means don't. It means this is not a suggestion. This is an imperative. Do not. And then he says, conform any longer. He's saying to the Romans, you've been conforming. You are conforming to, the, you, you're trying to do Jesus and his grace, but you're doing the lusts of the world. You're trying to do Jesus and his grace, but you, you're running after the desires of the world, which are money, which are wealth, which are he who dies with the most toys in his garage wins. I played golf at a golf course recently, and I went past this house, and this guy loved his car so much, he's put a glass wall around his garage, so you can see his glass, so his cars, while you play golf. On, and I'm like... Blessings to you, but the reality is that's not what my heart is due to be conformed to. And the apostle challenges the Romans, says, do not conform any longer. What's he saying? Stop it. You want to know the will of God? Number one, sin's not going to help you there. It's a bad guide. And he says this word, conform. What does that mean? I'm telling you, it's a challenging word. If you're in optometry, we've got some optometrists at Tableview, that if you lose an eye and they need to replace it with a, a new eye, one that's worked on by a master, it takes a little while, but to make sure they hold the integrity of that space, they put in a conformer. It's in the shape of the eye that holds the, the shape, otherwise your eye cavity begins to take smaller shapes. And I'm telling you, it continues. Some of you with fancy shoes who go to work, like you're fancy lawyers where your shoes are important and they've got those leather points, what they do is they take soft, supple leather, and, and they take that leather and they put it over a conformer, generally a piece of steel in the shape of, of the shoe that you would like in those days, and they would beat the living daylights out of that leather until that leather no longer has any ability to move. It takes a shape, and I'm telling you, the strategy of the enemy hasn't, isn't different. The strategy of the enemy, let me beat God's people with challenges and trials. And if they don't know how to access the grace of God, they are bent over, conformed, unable to walk in his will anyway. Bent over by sin, bent over by pain, bent over by, I've got to have this because everyone else has got this. I've got to access this. I want to go into that environment and experience that stuff because every other teenager is, why can't I? And what you don't realize, the apostle is saying, if you take those experiences and you take that now, and we sit talking with the young outs of the church last Sunday night about sexuality, if you allow the enemy into your life in the area of sexuality, he will conform you into brokenness. And you'll be going, God, where are you? But you are bent over, broken, being unable to have the view of his mercy. Maybe you've noticed I'm passionate about this. Isaiah 58, 55 verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. It's a challenge. This is a challenge. Do not conform. Like I said, young teenager, fall in love with Jesus. Please have grace on the young people in the life of our church. Please have grace in young people in general. I didn't grow up in a world with internet. I didn't grow up in a world with some of the options that are available in your room that are available now, which means we've got to fight for them in ways we haven't fought before and in ways our parents didn't know how to fight. But it starts in prayer. It starts in humility. It starts in a love. And it starts in calling people to God and his word, even young people, saying, David, let's take sexuality that the enemy wants to break early on. 
pornography being a brilliant example. It just breaks down the mindset, the concept, and young people get to honeymoon and they're going, wow, that was disappointing. Because they thought that that they'd watched for 15 years was the norm. Are we getting a little honest now? That's what I mean by conforming. And the apostle writes into, he says, do not conform. Your financial decisions, just because a banker says you can, doesn't mean you should. I looked at a car the other day. It was 450,000 rand. And at the bottom of the advert, it said, minimum gross salary, 8,000 rand. You will be eating those tires and chewing on the exhaust for months if you buy that car. And yet somehow the financial system of the world says, it's okay, you can afford it. You can't. Get some help if you need perspective, but be in the word of God and allow it to shape. Why? So that we do not conform to the patterns of this world. And then the apostle speaks. He says the first process is don't conform. It's hard work. It's not easy. I'm not saying this is easy. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, oh, I can be transformed. Whoa, like Bumblebee. Whoa, 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 whoa. Transformers, you're up. <laughs> yes, you can. I've watched it in my life. The example is for me in the front row. I married a wife, I met a young girl who'd been saved not two, three months, straight out of nightclubs, party drugs, radical insecurity, a broken home, and I watched God. Her, you wouldn't believe it, but when I met her, Candace just shaved her hair. And the hair was growing out because that's what they did in the rave clubs in the 90s, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> and, and God took someone in that state and said, I'm going to reveal myself as father to you. He put her under the preaching of a man who had an incredible revelation of the Father in heaven. And week after week, day after day, moment after moment, I watched God break off the conformity. I watched God break off the smallness. I watched God break off to a lady who stands up and people go, wow, that's amazing. I'm going, she wouldn't have stood up and spoken to me at home years ago. So we've got to come and allow our thinking about ourselves to be transformed. And how does the transformation happen? It means we change. Here's what you've got to understand. If you want to walk in the will of God, there's some change necessary. And most of us don't like change. God's saying there's transforming, there's change that's necessary. How? By the renewing of your mind. You know, your neural pathways can change for the negative and the positive. They can change by the fashioning of the word of God. They can change. It says in Luke 10, verse 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. How do I love God with my mind? Well, understand this. You're a believer of the gospel, not a doer. What you believe determines how you will live. When we start with our doing, that's called religion. But when belief comes in from the inside in faith, that's called I want to. It's a very different starting point. It says, well, what does that mean? Well, the challenges, it's a transforming process. It's not easy. Transformation is not about switching from a to-do list to kind of some other to-do list. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. And he wins again if he's able to somehow get some fog in the way of the minds and the thinking of believers. We've got to fight that. How? By the daily. Actually, let me rephrase that. By the every minute, every second, every moment, every hour, every day, renewing of our minds. Because every minute, every hour, every moment, there's the possibility of a deforming process that the enemy can get into our hearts and we become, sand. all of a sudden we're standing over here going, God, are you with me? He said, no, I've spoken to you. It challenges us. Why do we speak about sexuality to young people today? Because the world's telling the marriage is a joke. But God said something different. And the stats of this world can be what they are. In the UK right now, more pregnancies out of marriage than inside of marriage. They can be what they are. I don't care. My God spoke something different. And the stats can keep going down and I'll keep preaching about the God who's got something better, a God of original design who put sexuality in place and, let's say, and said, I want my children to have the best sex lives in the world. Please know that's the design of marriage. 
Please know there's a God of heaven who's a God of pleasure, and he gave a gift. It just had a context and it had a place called marriage. And then this brilliant promise says, then, then after you've fought the ways of this world and broken the patterns and allowed the word of God to come, then after the renewing of your mind and the transforming process that that induces in our lives, then you will be able to test and approve God's will. Oh, some of you are like, I like that. I want to test and approve. I, I, I need to test and approve. Now that comes from one Greek word, which means literally to be proved authentic, to be proved genuine. Like when they take those diamond testers to the gangster's teeth, you know? Mm, fake. Fake diamond in those teeth. Sorry, I've been watching too much Instagram. And, um, but, but there's got to be that place. I, I promise you, I'm standing here today pouring out because I'm telling you I would only be here because this is possible. And at a young age, I had I'd fought the brokenness of my parents' liquidation, gone into a, a world of corporate life and chased it with every being, bit of my being and said, God, I want to worship you, but I'm also going to chase this. I, this is what I want. And then I, I got to a place where opportunities were available. I got given another opportunity. I'm standing there. It was an opportunity to lead a business. I'm standing there saying, God, what do you want? It was an opportunity to step out at a young age and lead a business. And I felt just, I had a lack of peace. You know, the Bible speaks about righteousness, peace, and joy as these currencies that God speaks to his children. Is it right? Is there joy? And, it, and, and, and is righteousness peace? Is there peace? And you know that every now and again, um, maybe you've encountered it wherever. There's a song or poem, someone's writing, and you encounter it. Just at that time, you're never getting big things. Anyone agree? You've got like that song. And, and for me, there was this guy, Jason Upton. He, to me, also quite a weird guy. He would sing his chorus high, and then he'd go, ha, 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 ha. I'm like, why are you laughing? <laughs> Don't understand. It would irritate me. And I got given the CD while someone who knew nothing about this business opportunity. And we would drive in, in, in my fancy corporate car that I loved so much. And he started singing and then the song came on. He started singing. The will of the Lord, it's a bondage breaker. The will of the Lord, the will of the Lord. I'm like, what are you talking about? What does that mean, the will of the Lord? How, what does that mean for me in making this decision? And then I go to the Bible and I start reading, God shows that I can know his will. I can test and approve his will. I can stand with confidence and knowledge knowing, mm, I, don't, I don't know if God wants me to marry this woman. I'm telling you, and you can hold it to me for the end of my days, God's spoken to my soul, this would be my wife. I'm telling you. It's not a guessing game. I'm telling you that in a few big things in my life, God has spoken. God told me we would have children. There's the miracle. He was part of the prayer that opened up heavens to pour, give a life into our being. God speaks. He is not silent. He is not mute. He doesn't make open promises. And, then, and the last thing I know God told me to do was go to Cape Town and join a community called Life Changes Church. I knew nothing about them and they knew nothing about me, but I knew God would be there. And here's the thing, I didn't know if I could do it. We never will. You don't get the, all the T's and C's you love to put on God. What will it look like in five? You don't get to give God a five-year plan. You get to receive a better one. You get to receive a God who says, actually, whatever I call you to, I will sustain you through. If it's financially, emotionally, health, whatever it is, if I call you to something, I will sustain you through it every time. Maybe you need to hear that today. Maybe that's all you needed to hear. We worship a God who is so intimately involved and so intimately cares about his children that whatever journey he calls you to, he will sustain you through. Whether it's challenge, trial, or living in the highest mountains with views for days, I'm telling you, our God is a God who will sustain you what he calls you to. But if you're constantly walking your path and saying, God, will you bless my path, you will live insecure about whether God is good or not. You just will. Why? Because you've never actually asked him, and it's one thing to ask, it's another to surrender to it. Is that all right? You guys are right? 
Can I just mention one thing that I don't want to be overly strong about, but I've sat in so many counseling meetings and I've sat with people who are moving here and moving there and doing this. And this is the statement, oh, you know, God just opened a door. And I want to say this as graciously as I can, but I think that is Christian mysticism. I think we're taking the mysticism of the world and saying, let's put that on God because it conveniently works because I actually just want to walk through that door. And Jonah stood there and he said, I don't really want to go on the call of God because it looks hard. Oh, there's a ship going to Nineveh. That looks like an open door. And every time there are calls of God, there are going to be lots of doors. And I want to tell you about the enemy who can also open doors. Oh, Joseph's brothers, there's a pit. There's an open door for you to throw Joseph in. Sounds good to us. Open door. Woohoo. But I'm telling you, we, we, we've, we've lacked the trust, the ability to take God's word at its truth and trust God to speak. So we've come up with some other scenarios and solutions and we start speaking about these open doors. The enemy can open doors too. Yeah. I'm telling you. And the heartbreak of a, of a pastor sometimes is knowing some things that other people don't know about the decisions or lack of processing of people's decisions, seeing the chaos years later. And I'm going, if only they would ask God. brings wisdom, brings strength. Stephen, oh, there's an open door to be stoned, Stephen. Looks glorious, let's go. It wasn't an open door. He was looking into the presence of the glorious Father in the eyes of the Father's grace and faith was, well, eyes were upon him. It's a challenge. He says, then, after the non-conforming, then, after the transforming, then you will be able to test and approve. We all want the testing and approving here, hey? We don't want to go the non-conforming. I like conforming, because then people like me. Yesterday, having my head stitched up. Blood everywhere. Start talking to a lady. She started telling me a whole life story, moved from here to there. But she says, after all that, she says, oh, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. Whoop, end of the conversation. <laughs> Total end, like we did not talk again. Until it was done, she just said, oh, you're finished now. I said, thanks, cheers. That was it. Why? Because I stand for something. Because she knows I've allowed my life to be conformed to something called the word of God that might not affirm every belief she has, every ideology she likes. I know that. He says this, you'll get this. Then you'll be able to test and approve his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Oh, who doesn't want that? I want the good, perfect, and pleasing. I want it always. I want it for my kids. I want it for my life. I want the good, perfect, and pleasing will of God. Here's the thing, though. I'm standing, processing, and I'm wrestling the call of God and saying, God, I know I can do anything. You're with me because I'm your son. You'll love me. But God said, I want something for you. And here's the thing. It'll be good, perfect, and pleasing to me, but for you. See, when I tell my kids, don't run around in the streets at night because it's load shedding, it's dark, they're going, party, pooper. I'm going, no, I just don't want you hit by a car. They don't always know that because they haven't lost friends who have been hit by cars. I have. And, 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 and sometimes the will of a father, it seems like, ah. Can anyone testify that? Surely. You had it. I'm like, dad, Father. He says, now boy, let me express something to you. This will that you've been able to say is good for you. Is perfect for you. Forget about everyone else for a moment. For you, child of God. For you. And pleasing for you. It might not always seem good, perfect, and pleasing to you. But it will be for you. You're trusting for that life with the husband, the wife, the children. Well, I'm telling you that journey doesn't always come as easy as you think. And you can put a million things in the way, but to trust the will of God comes a sustaining power. And Lee's nodding with me there. She drives into one of the toughest parts of our city. Why? Because there's a call. There's a something of God that has spoken. I need you here. And actually, she could be a thousand other places, but every day, she leaves the comfort of her home and drives into one of the toughest parts of our city. Why? Because God called, and he will sustain her. And I promise you, not a hand will be laid upon that lady ever because of the grace of God that goes before her, above her, and over her in every day. And I pray for her by name. Because of the assurance of the promises of a good father. He 
She said, it's your choice to respond to his love and his will or live and live like there's a glorious father or to make your plans and live by them. And here's all I'm saying to you. You can make your plans. You'll have to sustain them. And when your plans don't work out and you need a miracle, God will listen, God will be there. But why not trust him today for a future story? Why not make a choice that there is a God who's got a plan for your story, a good, perfect, pleasing plan? And live that life, the life where there's a consuming fire. D.L. Moody provoked this kind of thought. He said, the world is yet to see what God can do with one man who is prepared to follow him fully. Just one man, one woman. You're wrestling your, uh, your state in life. You're wrestling your future. There's not a person on this planet who doesn't. I think, oh, we in South Africa. Now, when last did you speak to someone in the UK and they're fretting about an economy that they've lost 10% of their standard of living in the last nine months? And I phoned my mate the other day, I moved to the UK, and, and I had to have a little giggle inside because he's sitting in the freezing cold with the, air, the heater off because he can't afford it. And I just said to him, it's glorious, yeah, my buddy. It's 31 degrees, mild sea off the ocean. I'm just sharing that with you. And because you don't stop thinking it's easier somewhere else. The only place you can be fully assured is with God. Whether it's Daniel in the lion's den, whether it's David facing a Goliath, I promise you, child of God, be there. Can you stand with me in this moment? I'm telling you, there are too many stallions. I just had this picture. I had it a while ago. I was reminded of it, of Stallions in these stalls ready to run. Horses designed to run fast, to run powerfully, to carry heavy things. And, and the stalls open and they just stay because of insecurity. What's outside? We know what's in here. What's outside there? How fast will this guy be or that guy? So the church gets neutered and we stay. Stop looking at someone else and saying, wow, they built a business. And go before your father and say, what have you got for me? I'm telling you, too many prayers are this. God, show me how to build a business. A wrong prayer. God, what have you called me to that you will sustain me through? And, and that is the prayer of a son or a daughter of the living God. It is. I want to speak to young people or maybe even just people who are struggling and saying, I'd love someone to walk this life out and you're single right now. You're saying, I'm desperate for someone to walk this. Good, desire it. But throw yourself before the mercy of God and his grace and keep that in your view. And I promise you on the other side of that journey, the transforming, non-conforming journey, there is a glorious father who has a good, perfect and pleasing will for your life. Greater than any father of this earth could ever even dream. Can we just close our eyes for a second? I realize this is a strong word. I realize it's challenging. Please, even if the open door, closed door thing has been part of your language, all I ask is that you would go to the word of God and allow the word of God to fashion your thinking. That's all I ask. But I'm telling you the greatest challenge in the local church and the greatest challenge in the church is not the color of our walls. It's not the style of our worship. It's our lack of trust. It's a trust deficit that has entered. Or we can trust God that we'd have a good service. That's easy. To trust God for your future. To trust God in the face of your fears and the giants shouting. That's not so easy. But I'm called to trust. I'm called to be a son who when my father says left, I don't question why. Because my father is the creator of heaven and earth. My father spoke and it was. It was dark and he said, let there be light and there was light. My father knew that, that although he is perfect, he didn't get perfect children and I could never live a perfect life, so he sent his son to die. 
And only because of that death and the perfection of the blood of Jesus can I walk as a child of God, not separated from the presence of God. The first fear we've got to overcome is are we good enough for him to speak? Are you worthy? Am I worthy for the God of heaven to care enough? Mark, why would God care for me if no one else on this earth does? I want to tell you that's the very reason he loves you. And it's the very reason you can trust him. I don't know your status in life or desires on this planet. I don't know the passions that burn in your heart. I do know there's a father who's got desires for your life. Desires into your relational status. Desires for your family to thrive. Desires that you might be the first in many generations to leave wealth for the children below you. Wealth and integrity, wealth and strength, wealth financially, whatever it is. That there would be a blessing and ability to pour out beyond. I want to call us again to trust. I have to call myself every day to trust. When things don't go as planned, to trust. If you're fighting fears about the future, maybe fighting fears even about this nation right now, you're fighting fears about where you should be. You're wondering, you're a young parent saying, I don't know. I'm raising children, I've got a responsibility. I'm telling you, your number one responsibility is to trust God and hear God for your family. That's your number one responsibility. Otherwise, fears will dominate your thoughts. You will become conformed and a transforming power will not take place. If there's fears that are determining your steps, won't you lift your hands right now? You're saying, actually, there are fears in my heart that limit my ability to trust God. There's hands raised. Won't you raise your hands right now? I'd love to pray for the many. I think it's every one of us, to be honest, in many ways. God, we come in this moment. I pray that your word would speak. We surrender to your word. We submit to your word. Not my passion. Not my story. Your word. And we choose again to surrender to the goodness of God, the faithfulness of our King, your ability to provide futures for the broken, the lonely, whatever status we find ourselves in. Your ability to navigate us your strength above economies and currencies and politics and the narratives of this world. There is a God who spoke and he still speaks. You are the God who provided for Abraham when Abraham thought his son was the offering. You are the same king, the same God. We will trust you, God. We surrender to you, God. This morning, we surrender to your goodness. We surrender to your processes. You've got to surrender to the process. It won't be the process you thought. You've got to surrender to the process now. We love you, God. We trust you, God. We give you glory and praise. What an amazing, amazing word. If you would like to find out about what's happening in the life of the church, why don't you follow us on our social media, Instagram or Facebook, or you can go into our website, lifechanges.org.za. Thank you so much for watching that video. Be blessed.